Amen. Nehemiah chapter 12, beginning with verse 27. Tonight we're going to be talking about biblical worship. As we've been going through this uh, Old Testament book, uh, we only have one more chapter left here in Nehemiah. Uh, we'll be in next time, chapter 13. And uh, I don't know if we'll be in, uh, if it'll be one or two Sundays yet. It depends on, sometimes I think it'll be one Sunday and I get studying it and there's too much for one lesson, so then there will be two. So uh, we'll just go by what we see in the study there. Nehemiah chapter 12 begins verse 27. We're going to see the first point is the preparation for the dedication of the wall. We remember that amongst much opposition, they were faithful to complete the wall in 52 days. And even the enemies of Jerusalem had to say, this was of God. They had to recognize that God was enabling them, empowering them to be able to do this, even with military threat from those armies around them. They were literally surrounded by enemies and enemy armies all around Jerusalem. There were threats, but they didn't stop. They even said, okay, some of you are going to have to keep uh, guard and, and have the weapons ready. And even as they're building the wall, they would have one army they were using and they still had a weapon ready in order to fight if they needed to in the call, the, the, even the use of the trumpet the, uh, to gather, to rally to that point if there'd be attack there. So now they're preparing, the wall has been finished. Now they're going to dedicate this wall unto the Lord with thanksgiving. So they're preparing to do that. And that's going to be a great celebration of God's faithfulness. You know, there's times we were singing that wonderful hymn this morning, To God Be the Glory, Great Things He Hath Done. You know, you can't sing that song quiet, can you? It's almost like tonight we were singing, Because He Lives. There's times where there's a, a contemplative uh, hymn that we would do that is more prayerful mode. But there are some hymns that with thanksgiving that we just sing it with, with all our that we have just a lifting praise to the Lord for what he's done. So they're getting ready to do that. They're preparing and they're going to sing songs of thanksgiving. Notice verses 27 through 29. The Bible says, Now at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought out the Levites from all their places to bring them to Jerusalem so that they might celebrate the dedication with gladness. We've said last week when we looked at this together in chapter 11, there were so many that were living in the villages outside of Jerusalem. So they had to have a search to find the Levites to bring them back into Jerusalem because it was so sparsely populated. Even though the wall had been rebuilt, within Jerusalem was still a mess. There was still a lot of debris and a lot of work to do building wise. And so there were very few that were living within Jerusalem itself. And so now, in this celebration, they had to do a search to find out the Levites from all their places to bring them to Jerusalem so that they might celebrate the dedication with gladness, with hymns of thanksgiving, and with songs to the accompaniment of cymbals, harps, and lyres. You know, um, I was just talking to somebody at the Harvard Fair yesterday. Um, it was interesting because I love to hear Handel's Messiah. You know, you think about all the orchestra and all the music that's involved and, and all the different things, the voices, but all that's involved with that. And, and the, the crescendo, the, the praise that, it, you know, if that doesn't, I, I can imagine not having chills from that because of, of the message of of the whole handles Messiah, but going to the point, you know, the part, everybody stands up, don't they? And it's a celebration of praise, but it's reverence for God. And so you have here, they're getting ready to have great songs of thanksgiving in which they're going to be heartily praising with hymns and all sorts of instruments that were listed. And I have on your notes, 
uh, Tommy Heigel in the Journey into Renewal. This is the Journey series, a uh, pastor out in Oklahoma that has done the, the Journey series through a lot of the, I've used him work for many years and I just really appreciate this pastor and, and what he's done. Symbols, well we are familiar with this, symbols are the circular slightly concave brass plates used as percussion instruments. And um, there are some tremendous percussion instruments and um, the symbols serve a purpose, don't they? I never like to be really close to symbols when they're played. <laughs> because when I was in the band, I played trombone, so we didn't have a, a lot of the symbols. I, I was in the front end, but I tried hard. I played uh, the trombone. I practiced, but I was never good. And uh, that's just the honest truth. I was never good at it. And I was so bad, I was in my senior year. And we were at the uh, Secret Santa Parade, I think, in, in Westerville, in fact. And uh, big one, our band was in that, and I'm in the front, and there's a TV camera up ahead. And the band director yelled over to me, Brian, quit playing. <laughs> that helps your confidence a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> he was just concerned. He didn't want me playing with that camera right there. But I tried, but I wasn't good, but I tried. And so what happened was, I'd be in the front end. And the band and the, the instruments, and there would be, you know, we had that uh, cadence, the, the percussion, the drums back there, and you would be marching to that. So you can picture, here's the symbols. There, there's a purpose, the, the percussion instruments as part of this praise. And then they would have the, uh, the lyres, or the ancient harps are stringed instruments with several strings of different lengths. The lyres have fewer strings, and I like his comparison, they would be the guitars of the Old Testament. <laughs> the idea of, of the instruments for the singing of praise. But what was the purpose? It kind of reminds you of Psalm 150. You know, all the different instruments that, that they would be used to the glory of God that they would be to glorify him. And, and then the singing, that, the, that they're going to sing praises, the hymns of thanksgiving to him. In uh, verse 28, so the sons of the singers were assembled from the district around Jerusalem and from the villages of the Nedophathites, from Beth Gilgal, and from their fields in Geba and Asmaveth. For the singers had built themselves villages around Jerusalem. The priest and the Levites purified themselves. They also purified the people, the gates, and the wall. So as they're preparing for the celebration and of thanksgiving unto God, they also have the access here of the purification, the ceremonial cleansing that needs to happen. So that they can come to, as we were talking about this morning, so they're going to be coming before God with clean hands and a pure heart to be able to offer the worship to him. We see that so often, not only in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament. The importance of being clean before God. So the cleansing, that's point B. Chuck Swindoll in his book, Hand Me Another Brick, an excellent book on leadership with principles from Nehemiah and from 1978. He said, we're not told exactly what was meant by purification, but in no doubt it had to do with personal cleansing through a sin offering. So the idea of their offering, that that would be a cleansing, that they'd be purified so they would be able to use their lips, but their hearts would be pure before God. And the cleansing unto Him, and the lifting up the praise. In order to carry on the celebration of the wall, their hearts had to be pure. We too need to remember that to minister to other people, our hearts must be clean before God. I'm always struck by, remember at the, uh, the Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And of course, Peter says, Lord, what are you doing? This is the job for the lowest of the slaves. And here's the Lord, Jesus Christ. He has the towel and the basin and he's washing the feet. 
They're men, the men's feet. And Peter's like, are you going to wash my feet? You know, you, you're not going to do that. And if I don't do this, Peter, I, you'll have no part with me. Well, then not only my feet, Lord, but wash my head. Wash all of me. Give me a bath, in a sense. And the Lord said, you've bathed, which means you have believed, you have received your, your spiritual, quote, spiritual bath. You have been made clean spiritually, but your feet are dirty. Now, we know practically because they would have the, the dirt pass that they were walking on and the open sandals, the, the shoes, so their feet were dirty. But there's the spiritual application that Jesus made also. They were clean, but one of them wasn't clean. Who wasn't clean that was there? Yeah, the one who would betray him, Judas Iscariot. But Jesus said, you're clean, all of you, but you need to have your feet washed. In this filthy, dirty world, there's the idea of the cleansing. That we need to have, and that comes, and as we come before God, and that we are honest with him and confessing our sin, the First John 1, 9 principle that he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. He forgives us. And the cleansing, that is within the, uh, within the family of God. So that we need to have our hearts clean before him. Swindoll also writes, Moral carelessness and borderline sin give laughter a hollow ring. Mark it down, there can be no tolerance of evil, no laughing off of the things God hates. It really troubles me uh, today. Um, there are some pastors that take pride in swearing. And it breaks my heart because the Bible says, let no filthy communication proceed forth out of your mouth. And, and I think it's their idea, they think they're, quote, connecting with people, but it's a violation of God's word. I hate foul language. There's times when, even at the, uh, when we were walking around at the fair, there's, there's language we're hearing, and it's like, you know, why do they have to talk this way? You know, why, why use that? But you know, the thing about it is, it has no place with handling God's word. It has no place within the teaching. But there are those, uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but there was one pastor who liked to call himself the cussing pastor. And he identified himself as an evangelical, you know, pastor. And it's like, the doctrines, I don't know exactly what he was teaching, but the way he was doing it, hey, that that would give me a problem. If I heard him the first time, I'd have to walk out. I couldn't sit with that. Because what happens is, this is the idea that uh, it, it's just, a, it's carelessness. It's violating the word. And I think even there's some realms, even within the music, the actions. Uh, I remember Lisa and I years ago, we went to a concert, and this wasn't the main one, the, the ones that were singing before the, the main singer. The actions were so bad that uh, it was in a church, and we, we got up and we left the, the sanctuary because it, it was just so uh, improper. The dress, the, the, the actions and the things. And you know what? We're never to cloud the message of the cross. So there are those that say, all oh, methods don't matter. It, well, if they violate biblical scripture, biblical principles, they sure do. You don't violate the biblical principles to, to, you know, with, with, within things. And so what was happening is, I remember, you know, we left until the, the other singer was there and, and the sing, and I said, you know what? This isn't to be, take part. <laughs> this isn't to be a part of, they could be singing Christian lyrics, but the actions are distracting from the very message. And I think this is a major thing today. I, I think it's a, a major test. Uh, that do the methods violate the very principles of the Word of God. And I think we have to be wise 
So I think this is a situation that moral carelessness and borderline sin give laughter a hollow ring. There could be no tolerance of evil, no laughing off of the things God hates. And, and I think, um, I was, it's been a lot of years ago, I was very bothered by something. I went to a men's conference. It was in a stadium years ago. And one of the things that really concerned me was, well, I heard a couple teachers say some things that doctrinally were not really in line. And, and that concerns. But one of the big things was, in this stadium, people started chanting Jesus. But it became this rah rah, you know, this big emotional, this big emotional thing, and then they would go into this invitation. That invitation is based upon this emotionalism. Now the invitations must be based upon the Word of God, the clear proclamation, allowing the Holy Spirit to use the Scriptures, and uh, it break my heart because I used to work in camps and. We used to have tremendous preaching in this. That in the night we saw many come to know the Lord. We saw there were some people that were called into ministry, you know, in, in these camps. And then somebody showed me one time a videotape of these camps. There's a friend of mine that was working with them and, and said, oh, isn't this great? And I had tears coming down my eyes. They had replaced the proclamation of God's word the clear presentation of the scriptures and a biblical invitation with all music. Now music has an important role, but they replaced it. They didn't have the proclamation of the word of God. And I'm sitting there and, and they, they said, all the attendance at the camps has just swollen. And then there was all these kids and, and, and they showed them. And they were just jumping up and down and, you know, in circles and all this type of thing for all this time. And then they gave this invitation and all these kids were up front. But they would, you would see them, they would be laughing, they would just be doing everything. And it was all based upon this raw, raw feeling. It wasn't based upon the clear presentation of here is God's word. It's almost like the sense that some have, in the group that I used to be with, that they used to, they, they would call me, you're such a radical. Well, you know, I just think it was being biblical. But what happens is, one of the things that takes place is that they want to replace the proclamation of God's word, the biblical worship, with this pure emotionalism. Well, we're getting, see the results? There's... So all these decisions, all these people, there's people coming, and, and all, they, they like it. Is it biblical? That has to be our number one question, isn't it? Does it line up with Scripture? Not is it okay with the culture. Not is it like the lost world. Is it okay with the Bible? Is it line line with the Scriptures? And so what happens, the reason I bring that up, it's important not only the worship, but how we do worship, how we do worship Him. Is there anything today that's out of bounds, biblically? Yeah. <laughs> there better be something that we'd say, alarm bells go off and say, time out, this is not in line with scriptural teaching. And, and just because it may be seen as popular, just because there's many movements that would be doing things, the one thing you always have to check is, does it line up with God's Word? And we have to also be careful. The world measures success differently than the Bible does. The world might say, ah, oh, does it draw people? And how are the people responding to it? Those aren't the main questions. What is it? Lord, is this honoring to you? Is this in line with the scripture? Is it obeying the word of God and the principles of the scriptures?
the purification included the sprinkling of the blood of sacrificed animals. 1 John 1, 5 through 7, we're reminded that God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. So if we're communing with Him, if we're walking in the light as He is in the light, then it says the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin because we are confessing our sin to Him and He is purifying, He is cleansing us. And this is the purification, the cleansing that took place even before the singing and the dedication of the temple. Or the, I'm sorry, not dedication of the temple, the dedication of the wall that was rebuilt there in Jerusalem. Next, we're going to see the procession of the two choirs. This would have been something to see as we read this in Nehemiah chapter 12. Verse 31, Ezra led in one of the processions of the choirs. So Ezra, the spiritual leader, the one who has been faithful to teaching God's word, is going to lead in the procession of one of the choirs. And so let's see this in verse 31. Then I had the leaders of Judah come up on top of the wall and I appointed two great choirs, the first proceeding to the right on top of the wall toward the refuge gate. Hosiah and half of the leaders of Judah followed them with Azariah, Ezra, Meshulam, Judah, Benjamin, Shemaiah, Jeremiah, and some of the sons of the priests with trumpets. And Zechariah, the son of Jonathan, the son of Shemaiah, the son of Mataniah, the son of Micaiah, the son of Zechur, the son of Asaph, and his kinsmen... Shemaiah, Azarel, Malai, Galai, Maie, Nethanel, uh, Judah, and Hanani, with the musical instruments of David, the man of God, and Ezra the scribe, went before them. So you had the one choir that's going, and they're proceeding on the wall. The new rebuilt wall, they're up there, and they're walking around. Now on the other side, there's going to be the procession of the second choir. And so verse 37 says, At the fountain gate they went directly up the steps of the city of David by the stairway of the wall above the house of David to the water gate on the east. So the second choir proceeded to the left. Well, I followed them with half of the people on the wall above the tower of furnaces to the broad wall and above the gate of Ephraim by the old gate, by the fish gate, the Tower of Hananel, and the Tower of the Hundred, as far as the Sheep Gate, and they stopped at the gate of the guard. Then the two choirs took their stand in the house of God. So did I and half of the officials with me. Now what do we remember before? That when they began the work, remember what Tobiah said about this wall? That even if a fox would go up on that wall, it couldn't have told it. It couldn't withstand it. It would tremble. There were two choirs that were proceeding and that were on top of this rebuilt wall. It's, this wall was nine feet wide. Nine feet wide. So it had plenty of room to accommodate the procession of these two choirs. Can you imagine seeing all these choirs marching on that wall? And then they end up for the, the worship. So Nehemiah follows the second choir. The participation in worship. God had given them great joy. I think that's an important point. It's not generated by man. God had given them this great joy. It came from God. God had given them. In verse 42, the singers sang with Jezariah their leader, and on that day they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced because God had given them great joy. 
even the women and children rejoiced so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard from afar. God had given them that great joy. Would you go over to Psalm 95? I love this psalm. Psalm 95, we're going to see the first, some, uh, the first uh, verses here. O oh, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods, in whose hand are the depths of the earth. The peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for it was he who made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. All that call to, to praise the Lord, to sing unto him, to shout joyfully to him. Oh, one of my favorite hymns. I love to hear when, I, when we all get to heaven. We'll sing and shout the victory. We'll sing and shout. That's another hymn you can't sing quietly. <laughs> That's another hymn that you sing out. I remember a good friend of mine that had pastored the Newark Baptist Temple for 46 years when he went to be with the Lord and and uh, they sang that at his, he, they called it his home going. And, uh, or no, I'm sorry, it was his graduation, his graduation service. And so they, everybody sang, and they sang that with such, you know, just lifting up the praises to the Lord when we all get to heaven and sing and then shout the victory. And so. Can you imagine that as they're celebrating God's goodness, the, de the dedication of the wall, the choirs have formed, and that is a song of great crescendo and of praise to him, for he is worthy. And not only did they sing it, what happened? People from afar could hear their great joy. I love that. Because how many enemies of Jerusalem could hear the praises to God? Could hear them at the dedication of this wall. They're curious. <laughs> what are they doing marching on that wall? These big choirs. And they could hear from some distance. The joy of Jerusalem was heard. Tommy Heigl writes, the first obvious sign that renewal has happened in a church is the singing gets louder and better. Now I do realize there are some hymns that are more prayerful in nature and, and that we don't sing loudly. But there's something. I tell you what, the singing today, tonight, the singing has been tremendous to people have been singing. And I, I love that because even at the ordination service, I had some friends say, you know, they made this comment. And I loved it because it's true. That's a singing church. That's a great thing for First Baptist Festival to be known for. Amen? The people lifting their voices of praise to God, singing unto Him. And who's pleased in that? He inhabits the praises of his people. He is worthy. He's worthy. And you know what? It's a choir practice for heaven. Revelation chapter 5, verse 11 to 14. We're going to be singing, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. I can't carry a tune worth anything here, but I'm looking forward in heaven singing, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain.
He's worthy to receive all the glory. The provision of contributions. Not only were they praising God for what he had done, empowering them to build that wall. But the Bible says in verse 44, the provision of contributions. We see Nehemiah was a man of worship. On that day, men were also appointed over the chambers for the stores, the contributions, the first fruits, and the tithes to gather into them from the fields of the cities the portions required by the law for the priests and Levites. For Judah rejoiced over the priests and Levites who served. For they performed the worship of their God and the service of purification together with the singers and the gatekeepers in accordance with the command of David and of his son Solomon. For in the days of David and Asaph, in ancient times there were leaders of the singers, songs of praise and hymns of thanksgiving to God. So all Israel in the days of Zerubbabel and Nehemiah gave the portions due the singers and the gatekeepers as each day required, and set apart the consecrated portion for the Levites, and the Levites set apart the consecrated portion for the sons of Aaron. So they were faithful in giving. They gave willingly, didn't they? They gave willingly to the Lord. The final point is, the people kept their agreement. This is exactly what they said they would do in Nehemiah chapter 10. You can go back and see those verses, verses 37 to 39. We will also bring the first of our dough, our contributions, the first of every tree, the new wine and the oil to the priest at the chambers of the house of our God, and the tithe of our ground to the Levites. For the Levites are they who receive the tithes in all the rural towns. The priest, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive tithes. And the Levites shall bring up the tenth of the tithes to the house of our God, to the chambers of the storehouse. For the sons of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of the grain, the new wine, and the oil to the chambers. There are the utensils of the sanctuary, the priests who are ministering, the gatekeepers, and the singers. Thus we will not neglect the house of our God. They kept their word. When you prepare the tithes and offerings, make it a worship service. Make it a time of thanksgiving. As you are giving and, and obeying the scriptures to being a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. He cares about the attitude. And so what can I do? I love that in Proverbs because he says, give of the first fruit. Give of the first of, of that increase and, and, and the idea of, of what God will do. It's by faith. It's by taking God at his word. So it's a good time to just have a worship service of praising God for his provision. And Lord, by faith, I'm obeying your word. I'm giving this forth. You have been so faithful. I'm so grateful. And I'm just giving this back to you. You own it all. You have called me to be a steward of what you have given. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. All that the earth contains. Everything has come from him. We are his stewards. We're managers of what he has given. And when you do that, then you can have an attitude of, thank you, Lord. And giving that by faith, trusting him. And Lord, because you have been so faithful, I'm giving this first. And I'm trusting you that you'll provide. And he is the great provider, amen? So that's an important part of worship. The biblical worship, they were preparing to dedicate the wall. They sang praises. They proceeded to the temple. They, had, they were singing songs of thanksgiving to God for what he had done. And God had given them that joy. And they could hear from afar. 
I always love to hear the children sing. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise you, the Lord. I've heard different times where they can hear that afar. <laughs> and they're singing, but it's praise the Lord. We used to do early mornings. Campers would get up really early and we would say, attitude check. And they'd say, praise the Lord. And different times we'd have to do attitude check. Maybe we need attitude check as we come before him. Am I ready to praise you, Lord? Would you bow for prayer? As we pray, we want to continue to lift up Mary Erton is recovering at home for the continued strength. Also, Carolyn Bonom, or Bonomi, I don't know how, uh, at the apartment, she's back to the village of Westerville, but for her strength. Charlotte said this morning uh, they were not able to do the um, chemotherapy on Thursday. She's to go back to the James this coming Thursday. So we want to lift up Charlotte as she would begin that and, uh, and other needs that we have. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we've had this opportunity together tonight to look into your word and, and Lord, to see how they worshiped you. And Lord, forgive us of any times that we would come before you with not a proper attitude of worship, for you are worthy. And may we be reminded from your word that we would come with the right attitude. And Lord, we, we do lift up Mary right now and pray. Thank you so much for how you've been bringing her along and after her surgery. And dear Lord, we pray for her continued strength and the progress, Lord. Thank you. As she is quick to give you the praise for what you've been doing. Father, we pray for Carolyn and uh, we ask that you give her the strength as she was uh, very much in a weakened state from being in the hospital and, and dealing with uh, congestive heart failure, the fluid and uh, various problems that she's been having. We pray that you would encourage and help her even uh, now with her strength and, and Lord, as she looks to you. We pray for Charlotte as she uh, goes again Thursday. And Father, that you would uh, just empower her uh, through getting this treatment, Lord. And uh, we pray that you would give that doctor the wisdom as she has this treatment, Lord. And, and we know of Charlotte's love for you. Lord, there are other requests we just bring before you right now. And you know each one, each heart. And we thank you for this opportunity to come together tonight. And we pray as we leave here that we're being mindful to allow others to see Jesus Christ living in us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.